Uh, if you could, if senators can please leave uh, the chamber quietly, and we're. I just want to inform the Senate that Senator McKenzie has withdrawn the matter of public importance, which she has proposed for today. A proposal from Senator Barrett has been received under Standing Order 75 as follows. Is, is the proposal supported? It is supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with informal— sorry. Just for the clarity for the uh, chamber, there were more than four people standing in their correct seats. So, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call Senator Bobet. Thank you. Now, Australia, we are facing an energy crisis, an energy crisis that threatens to cripple industry, impoverish families, and if it is not urgently addressed, we will see, we will see our standard of living decrease and we will see our people suffer. The fact that we find ourselves in this position beggars belief. As a nation, we have a clear competitive advantage abundant and easily accessible coal and gas. I keep talking about it. We should have the cheapest energy in the world, but we don't. Instead, we have manufacturers and businesses closing and collapsing all across our nation under the weight of energy bills. In fact, the cost of electricity is going to rise by about 30 per cent this year in my home state of Victoria. Now, the Smithfield Oh, sorry, the snack brands factory in Smithfield reported some months ago that their gas bill had gone from $3 million a year to $9 million a year. And you know where that factory is located? In Energy Minister Chris Bowen's electorate. Who needs enemies when you've got mates like Minister Bowen as your local member? Don't need enemies. Now, our current energy crisis is not the fault of some far-off distant war like some in this place have tried to allege on more than one occasion. Perhaps if that was the case, it would be easier to understand. Instead, our crisis is self-inflicted, and the hurt that we are currently experiencing can easily be avoided. The Albanese government and the Greens are determined to shut down all coal and gas. The government, of course, well, I hope anyway, of course, hopes to do this without destroying business, impoverishing families and endangering our national security. This is a pipe dream. This is a pie-in-the-sky plan. It is simply not possible to achieve net zero using solar panels, wind farms and batteries, not while at the same time maintaining our standard of living. If the government is determined to put an end to safe, effective, cheap, reliable and abundant coal and gas and maintain our nation, then the government must embrace nuclear energy. We have no other option. If we do not, we will suffer exactly the same as some other nations across the world are suffering right now. If the government is determined that Australians must not use our abundant coal and gas, then let's use our abundant uranium instead. But here's the irony. Just like we're exporting our coal and gas, we're also exporting our uranium to other countries where they are using it. They are benefiting, it, benefiting from it and we're not. We are the third largest exporter of uranium in the world. And that's just crazy that we're not taking advantage of it. Now, for those who say they are worried that catastrophic climate change is about to end the earth because of CO2, which is just plant food, well, nuclear power, there's your answer. But what about the expense? Well, yes, it might cost a little bit up front, but it's an investment which secures our power needs for the long term. Renewables, however, are not renewable at all. The only thing renewable about renewables is the expense. Every 15 or so years, roughly, you've got to bury your solar panels in the ground, in landfill, buy new ones. Every 10 years, you bury the batteries, buy new ones. Every 20 years, you bury the wind turbines, you buy new ones. Where do you buy them from? Mostly China. The CCP controls most of the supply chain when it comes to renewables. Nuclear, when, com when compared to that possible future, is in fact not expensive. It is better for our environment, especially when you, can, when you can compare the cost of this 
against rebuilding our national infrastructure to accommodate renewables. With nuclear, you can build a plant in the existing footprint where the coal-powered fire plant is right now, and you can keep the infrastructure as it is. No changes. How good is that? Now, instead of acres of solar panels and hillsides dotted with wind turbines, we can have a facility roughly the size of an IKEA powering millions of homes. We need to stop cowering in fear at the thought of the word nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is the answer for the 21st century. There is no option. If we do not look at nuclear energy, our only other alternative is poverty. Thank you. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, I'm uh, honoured to, to stand and support uh, uh, this matter of public importance and congratulate Senator Babette for bringing it forward. Uh, the acquisition of uh, five nuclear uh, or up to five nuclear submarines has removed any logical reason for Australia to continue to ban uh, nuclear energy in this country. Sometimes we hear uh, that we, we can't go down the path of nuclear energy because we have nowhere to store the waste. Well, we are going to now have a high-level waste facility because of the acquisition of nuclear submarines. That, will, that hurdle will have already been jumped. That is done. We sometimes hear uh, that it, it could potentially be too unsafe and there could be some sort of accident or issue. Well, we're going to have up to five nuclear reactors sailing around our coastline uh, 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 underwater just next to major population centres docked in our harbours. Uh, no safety concerns about that. It would be completely illogical to legalise the sailing of nuclear submarines right around our coastline while we continue to having those same facilities onshore and on land in this country. Because we do have a massive energy deficit right now, our energy regulators are warning that we are 8,000 megawatts short of reliable power over the next decade. And that can't be filled by solar and wind. That is of dispatchable capacity that we need. Now, these nuclear subs, maybe we could have an innovative solution. We could dock them in Sydney Harbour, go get a big extension cord from Bunnings, and, re and that's 1,000 megawatts of that 8,000 could, could come in uh, into and provide electricity. But a more logical option would be actually to build an advanced uh, nuclear reactor in this country, as, as happens in every settled continent in this world except for Australia. It is us and the penguins now who don't have nuclear energy in the world. Every other continent, every other settled continent, settled continent in the world relies on nuclear energy. It has done for decades safely. It is about time now we get over this ridiculous uh, paranoia uh, and legalise nuclear energy so Australians can get cheaper power. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many amazing people who make up our one Queensland community, I note that nuclear is the answer to humanity's energy needs. The only question is whether we embrace nuclear technology now and set Australians up for a prosperous future, or we keep promoting unreliable, expensive wind and solar that will end as landfill every 12 to 15 years. Australia can never achieve a sustainable energy grid if every new wind and solar power unit we build dies so quickly. The energy required to break down a solar panel dwarfs its profit. Even the ABC admits that solar panel waste will outstrip all other e-waste by 2035. Nuclear energy is a single build project with a small ongoing fuel supply whose waste output is tiny, completely contained and capable of being used as fuel for reactors. In other words, truly renewable and, low, and zero uh, output of carbon dioxide. Not that carbon dioxide is a problem. It's, uh, it's uh, plant, food, plant food. It's a proudly Australian-centric energy system that doesn't require dependence on long supply lines from communist China. Nuclear will keep the lights on in Australia independent of the weather. The European Union has embraced nuclear as the gold standard in green technology. They've tried solar panels. They've tried wind turbines. They don't work. So why are parties in this place insisting on subjecting everyday Australians to electricity cost and reliability nightmares? Why are you ignoring the science? A one gigawatt nuclear plant is equivalent to 430 wind turbines or three million solar panels demolished and replaced six times in the life of one new generation nuclear plant with a life of 100 years. This is why the United Nations and World Economic Forum's crooks and disciples are trying to make nuclear a dirty word because they know they can't compete on any environmental or economic 
argument. Nuclear energy is freedom. Nuclear energy is national security. Nuclear energy is the answer to maintaining everyday Australians' living standards. I thank Senator Brevet for, for the motion. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Uh, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy has laid out the government's energy and emissions reduction plan and has clearly articulated, very clearly articulated, that nuclear will not be part of Australia's energy mix. Nuclear is the most expensive form of energy. So there's a good reason, right? It is the most expensive form of energy which has been reaffirmed over and over again by various people. The CSIRO, in their 2021-22 GenCos report, the report calls nuclear energy commercially immature and high cost. The report um, also affirms that the cheapest form of energy are mixed renewables, such as wind and solar. So I would be delighted to introduce Senator Babette to, uh, to some scientists, maybe some economists, um, and that might help inform him in terms of his pathway on pushing for nuclear energy. Senator Babette's friends on the opposition benches, they've been unsuccessful in prosecuting this nuclear argument in nine years under their own government. They can't get their own people to support it. Their own people won't back it. So I'm not quite sure where that's going for those in the opposition. The Senators, uh, I remind you that uh, other speakers have been heard in silence, so I remind people to give the same courtesy to Senator Grogan. So nine years of a Liberal National Government, during which we had 22 stop-start energy policies and three gigawatts of dispatchable energy exit the grid without being replaced. I hardly think that those opposite are in a position to be providing uh, a way forward on our energy issue. And then, of course, when we introduced our energy price relief package, you wouldn't support it. A package to reduce the effect on people's hip pocket, to take down the prices. We've seen prices skyrocket and they started under the opposition government. And in our attempts to bring it down, you guys all vote against it because you Senators, would rather you would rather you. invest in very very expensive nuclear energy. Yeah, I'd love a medal. Thank you, Senator Canavan. If you could just make me one, that'd be great. Senator Grogan, I fear Senator that the facts Grogan, on nuclear energy Senator generation. Grogan, I remind you and Senator Canavan that uh, it is disorderly to interject, and your comments should go through the chair. Pay the same courtesy was, was displayed to you, Senator Canavan. My apologies. But I do fear that the facts on nuclear energy generation are somewhat lost on my colleagues across the room. The reports, I know um, there are a number of you who have cast aspersions on the CSIRO in the past, and so rather than just to keep quoting them, I will add a bit more. Um, detail from other sources that you may prefer. So, particularly the nuclear energy industry, yeah, that's right, the nuclear energy industry admits that, it, that cost is a prohibitive factor compared to renewable energy. The World Nuclear Industry Status Report in 2020, not the CSIRO, if you're paying attention, but the World Nuclear Industry Status Report stated, and I'll quote it to you, the cost of renewables continue to fall due to incremental manufacturing and installation improvements, while nuclear, despite over half a century of industrial experience, continues to see costs rising. Now that same report goes on to say that the levelised cost of energy analysis by the US bank Lazard shows that between 2009 and 2021, Utility-scale solar costs came down 90 per cent, wind came down 72 per cent, and new nuclear costs increased by 36 per cent. So, sure, I get it that maybe you don't like some scientists, you don't like some 
organisations because you think they believe in climate change or various other things that you can't get behind. But this is the industry itself. This is the report on the industry, the industry itself, telling you exactly what the costs look like. So you enjoy that at your peril and ignore it at the countries, I believe. We have now seen a decade of denial and delay as far as our energy sector is concerned. And now the transition to renewable energy is going to have to boost. We know this. The level of investment has been low, but it is growing. Since we legislated the 43 per cent target, investment has increased, and it will continue to increase Thank you, for Senator, renewable your time energy. Thank you, Senator. has expired. Senator B. Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The proposal for nuclear power for Australia is wrong on many counts. Small modular nuclear power, reaction, uh, power generation is too expensive. It's not operating commercially. It's a distraction from what we have to really get on with, which is a very fast move to renewables. We senators in this place have a responsibility to consider realistic proposals to advance citizens' interests, not run impractical, risky, uncommercial proposals up the flagpole on behalf of, in this case, nuclear industry spruikers. Last time I looked, only two small modular reactors were in operation on the planet, one in China, one in Russia, and in both cases the cost blowouts have been huge. Many other such next generation nuclear reactors have been cancelled as people have worked out that renewables are the cheaper, reliable way forward. But I want to especially focus on what Minister Canavan, Mr. Canavan, Senator Canavan has raised, and that's the question of nuclear waste disposal. The truth is that finding a permanent solution for the safe storage of nuclear waste arising from power generation remains a big, dangerous problem everywhere, a very expensive problem. The UK has 70 years of waste, 260,000 tonnes of it, from its nuclear power plants in unsafe temporary storage. It's a major problem for that country and its citizens. And the US nuclear industry has been plagued, similarly, by dangerous leaks and failures. No long-term solution exists in the US, not for waste from power generation or from nuclear-powered submarines. South Australians have had some experience with these issues. In 2016, our citizens had a very close look at a proposal that we take the world's nuclear power waste and store it. We were promised an income stream of $51 billion. That's a lot of money, but South Australians said no. The world's largest citizens' jury of 350 South Australian citizens read the fine print. They saw the proposal was for temporary storage for above ground for more than a century. They said no to the false promise of huge incomes, but especially to the safety risks and the fact that those who spruik nuclear power never offer a long-term waste solution that is safe and that will last the 100,000 years that it's needed. And First Nations people across South Australia in particular said no. They remember Maralinga. So this is a national challenge of long standing. Since Australia first started producing nuclear waste 70 years ago, five successive governments have tried and failed to find a suitable place for permanent storage of our relatively small quantities of low level and intermediate level waste. Low waste arising from medical uses must be stored safely for 300 years, and it's nowhere near as dangerous as intermediate waste. But no community in this country has agreed to take and store that waste. Intermediate level waste arising from research at Lucas Heights must be safely stored for 10,000 years. The previous government began a process towards that storage at Kimber, and it's been bitterly disputed at every step of the way since, posed by farmers, by community members, by First Nations people, the Bungala people, who are currently in the federal court fighting the current government, which is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to, um, uh, to oppose the voice of the Bungala people. In the case of AUKUS, the fuel from decommissioned submarines is nuclear weapons grade and it requires military scale security and must be stored not safely not for 300 years, not for 10,000, but for 100,000 years. And neither the UK or the US have been able to find permanent storage solutions for their own submarine waste. So given that successive governments have continuously failed to manage much less dangerous radioactive waste in Australia, a government would find it very difficult in this country to find a solution to dispose of nuclear waste 
or AUKUS submarine waste, and traditional owners of the future in particular should have a say and a veto about any such proposal. So a long list of reasons why the $368 billion spend proposed for AUKUS is a terrible idea, but it's not least because the government has no viable solution to, to, to care for the weapons-grade nucleus waste and keep us safe. The Australian public is right to be sceptical and concerned about waste disposal in relation to AUKUS. There is no plan, and the same argument applies to any ill-considered expensive adventurism around nuclear power. Our children need practical, affordable action on renewable energy that cuts carbon pollution, not pies in the sky that generate toxic waste for which there are no safe solutions. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Van. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 1,430 terawatt hours per year is the amount of electricity needed to be able to power Australia to be a green energy superpower, something that we all aspire for this country to be. That is an awful lot of energy. If we are going to power that through green energy, we have to consider all options to do so, nuclear power being exactly one of those. There is no way that we can get to net zero emissions, or even better, zero emissions, without nuclear baseload power. So all clean energy options need to be on the table. So that includes nuclear, pumped hydro, geothermal, all sorts of other ways. This fixation on renewables only is a fallacy that's being sold to the Australian public. And they're being lied to because there is no way that we can get to where we need to be and be a hydrogen superpower simply on renewables. The variable and intermittent nature of those generation techniques are not doable. Now, my learned friend over here talked about unproven technologies. And the other fallacy that uh, the Australian people are sold on is that batteries can solve this. There is no battery that can provide the deep storage of energy that will be needed to firm up intermittent power from wind and solar sufficiently enough to power in industries as they are now, let alone as we electrify industries to reduce emissions down to the lowest possible part we can. So stop telling lies. Nuclear power is a proven technology and it will play a part in our energy mix in the future. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. I'm very happy to stand and speak on this um, matter of public importance today um, because it gives me an opportunity to talk about a number of matters, particularly our government's record on delivering on um, our renewable energy plan to make this country a renewable energy superpower. But it particularly gives me an opportunity to talk about two things. Um, the, the the debate that we are having about nuclear energy in this place and why we are having that debate and who is pushing that debate in this chamber. Uh, because we know um, that there's a reason that the Liberal National Party is pushing nuclear as a, um, a form of energy, and it's because they're um, distracting from their bitter disunity and denialism on climate change and the fact that they don't want to see this country become a renewable energy superpower. Uh, I am proud that one of the first actions of our government was legislating our emissions reductions targets. Our government has a clear commitment to renewable energy. We know that firmed renewables are the cheapest form of energy and they are getting cheaper every single day. If we hadn't lost 10 years of investment, we would be far beyond where we are now, but we are making good headway in catching up we are working with states and territories to deliver renewable energy projects across the country. It's why we're delivering our Powering Australia plan, but we're also choosing to invest in renewables through the National Reconstruction Fund, an incredibly important piece of legislation that those opposite have dealt themselves out of. We want to see our regions become renewable energy powerhouses, and I speak of the region that I come from in far north Queensland when I talk about um, the wind, solar and uh, pumped hydro opportunities that will create jobs in regional Queensland. But it's important to understand where we've come from over the past 10 years and why we are now having this debate, 
why we're, why we're at a point where we have a genuine discussion about renewable energy not being the way forward. And it's because the LNP's record on energy is abysmal. They vetoed in government, the Liberal National Party vetoed renewable energy projects that would have created hundreds of jobs in regional Queensland. In Queensland, the Liberal National Party tried to sell off the state's power assets so that we couldn't have public in, um, energy in public hands. Now, when it came to um, promising what um, power they would generate, they did um, promise years and years ago to build a coal-fired power station in North Queensland. That never happened because there is, no, um, there is nothing from this former government when it comes to delivering on the promises they made. Heading up into the election, they hid key information about electricity prices from Australia ahead of the election. And now in opposition, they choose to vote against energy bill relief in this chamber. They talk about reducing power prices, but they're not prepared to vote for cheaper power bills. We know what the experts say about nuclear energy. It's expensive, it is slow, it is the hardest to deliver when it comes to forms of power. Now that isn't members on this side of the chamber saying that. That's the CSIRO. They've done these reports time and time again and found that nuclear energy would be far, far away the most expensive form of energy in Australia. That is the experts telling us the way forward when it comes to nuclear energy. We're facing an energy crisis right now in this uh, country and in this world, and um, it is a matter of um, deep concern that a party of government is pushing a form of energy that would not have a plan that would take decades to establish. But why is the Liberal National Party talking about nuclear energy? Well, it's purely because, purely because they are completely disunified when it comes to their beliefs about climate change and renewable energy itself. They don't believe in renewable energy. They don't believe in climate change. They don't believe on doing anything about it. Now, the Liberal National Party can choose to generate a debate about nuclear energy, but they are using it as a distraction from the fact that they continue to drift further and further to the extreme far right on issues like this and others that we have seen play out in the national debate this week. But the Australian public know that the former government did nothing on energy. The proposal that they are putting forward around nuclear is uncosted, won't be delivered, and won't deliver the jobs that regional Queenslanders deserve. And I urge this Thank chamber you, to Senator push Green. back on this debate. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I cannot believe that we are actually here talking about nuclear power. Nuclear power makes no sense on so many fronts. It is a dangerous undertaking and can never be fully accident free. As we have seen with Fukushima and Chernobyl, this is simply not a risk we can take for anybody living now or in the future. My people have known for many thousands of years that this poison, uranium, needs to stay in the ground and never be touched. It causes sickness and death. There is a lot of talk about next generation nuclear re reactors, but their concept, even if they were somehow magically safe, the technology does currently not exist to scale. So it is not even an option until some time in the future anyway. And even economists agree that nuclear is financially not, I repeat, not viable. Investment in nuclear energy would also slow the decarbonisation of our economy and would actually increase electricity costs, which you all are always so concerned about. Last but not least, we have absolutely no idea how to safely manage high-level nuclear waste for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Nobody knows this, probably because it's actually not possible to make it safe for such a long time and communicate with generations in thousands of years. 
The, pro the proposition of nuclear energy is dangerous, dangerous eco economically, dangerous for our clean energy journey, dangerous for humanity. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. In the last 30 years, nuclear energy has come a long way. The Greens like to remind us of the Chernobyl disaster, but the fact is nuclear technology has advanced tremendously since 1986. Nuclear energy in Australia has great potential to contribute to the global movement towards low emission technologies, and this is widely recognised by experts. Now, putting aside your personal views on the net zero debate, we're certainly not going to achieve it with only wind, turbines and solar panels. The entire world looks to us confused. They don't understand why we have a moratorium in place on nuclear energy. Uh, all we know is we're now working towards gaining nuclear submarine capabilities, so why not nuclear energy? In the United States, nuclear constitutes 20 per cent of the energy mix there, and there is bipartisan agreement in Congress about the importance of nuclear energy to help the US achieve its climate ambitions, its energy security and its sovereignty. President Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act has a heavy emphasis on the important role that it will play in the US. Now, I quote directly from the Office of Nuclear Energy's website, which says, Momentum is building for the US nuclear energy and the investment and tax incentives included in the IRA guarantee a commitment to nuclear energy that will continue well throughout the nation's journey to net zero. We must get our heads out of the sand and seriously look at lifting the moratorium. Now, I'm not even saying that we should necessarily build a nuclear power plant. We should just lift the moratorium. This way, we'll allow industry to explore the opportunities and for universities, importantly, to commence the important work of skilling up our workforce that will be critical for any future nuclear industry here in Australia. We're still having the same discussion here today that we were having when I was born. And the rest of the world is, frankly, leaving us behind. Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Senator did you? I wanted to make, uh, seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Uh, well, I might just. What I might just is finish this, and then I'll come to you. So the time for discussion has expired. I will.